Make me holy like you That I may do the things you do Make me holy like you That I may ever feel your fire How many of you are sad to see 2020 go away? <laughs> it's kind of like I don't know, there are certain gestures that you want to use. No. Mine, mine is, bless you. All right, some of you got that. <laughs> okay. How was everybody's Christmas? Good times? So the COVID Grinch didn't steal your Christmas? All right. No Grinches. Beth and I had a great time. And, uh, yeah. And it's good to see actually this many here two days after Christmas. A lot of people out of town and, and uh, stuff like that. So, Jesus. Lord, we need your word. We feed on your word. We love you, Lord. We just want to be with you. We want to drink of everything that you are and everything that you have to say. So come, Lord, and just carve the words today. Since this is so close to Christmas, we're kind of not quite done with things that you might think about as Christmas. So you want to turn to Luke 2? If you got your Bible, your iPad, your phone, you know, whatever it is that you read from. This part of the story of the birth of Jesus actually happened when Jesus was about 40 days old. This didn't happen at the nativity. He's 40, about 40 days old. Jewish law required that his parents would bring him to Jerusalem to the temple on the 40th day to dedicate him to the Lord. The firstborn of the womb, Scripture says, belongs to the Lord. That's Exodus 13 too, where the Lord said, Sanctify to me every firstborn, the first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both of man and beast, it belongs to me. And the reason it was 40 days is because 40 days were the days of purification that were prescribed for a woman after childbirth. I think it was God's way of saying she needs time to heal, give her a break. So two people were there that day, on that 40th day. Two people were there in the temple who recognized in the spirit what was happening and who Jesus was. Out of all the people in the temple that day, and they came directly to speak with Mary and Joseph, and he came right to them, picking them out of all of that crowd of people. It was a moment that they had waited for all of their lives, those two. And so Luke 2, start verse 25. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Well, that was the first one. Well, this was a day when the culture valued men above women when a woman's testimony was not considered to be worth much, a woman, if a woman testified in court, sometimes she wasn't even believed because it, she wasn't a man. It was a time when women didn't hold positions of power or authority. But the cool thing is, God doesn't think like men. He doesn't think like the cultures of men. And so all the way through Scripture, you find Scriptures salted with references to women where God is recognizing their gifts and their callings and giving them honor, place, and leadership. 
God raised up prophetic people among women throughout the Bible, and he gave them equal place and position. He spoke to women in the same way that he spoke to men. And so verse 36, and there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. So Anna gets introduced as a prophetess. That's a high office in Israel. That's not inconsequential. That title was bestowed only on those who had earned it. So the people recognized Anna's gift, and they honored her for the quality of her ministry. It goes on to say she was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. Verse 37, and then as a widow to the age of 84. And then Luke described the primary task of any truly prophetic person. She never left the temple, serving night and day with fastings and prayers. Now, I'm not saying all you prophetic people got to come live at the church. That ain't working. (laughs) But the primary task of any prophetic person is intercession, prayer, seeking the depth of intimacy with God. Now, the temple in the time of Jesus was controlled by a corrupt priesthood. I hear Christians complaining all the time about how the church is corrupt and the, you know, leadership sucks. And, you know, I'm tired of hearing it. Don't talk to me anymore about that. (laughs) Really, I'm, I'm tired. And I've said this before. You want to make me mad, pick on my bride. You want to make Jesus mad, pick on his bride. Stop it. I want to say sometimes, who do you think you are? Okay, so, (laughs) anyway, that corrupt priesthood profited and got rich by maintaining political connections with the Roman occupation government, collaborating with them. They got rich by cheating the people with the exchange of worldly money for temple currency. You gotta understand how that works. They, They thought worldly money was too unclean and too unholy to be used as offerings at the temple. So they would come to the outer court of the temple and they would exchange their worldly money for temple currency and then they'd make their offering. Well, they were cheating people there, overcharging them. And they were cheating the people with um, the sale of sacrificial animals. They ran a religious racket at the expense of the people. You know, if you see some of that today, it's not the first time it's happened, right? And in the face of this, here's what you don't see. You don't see Anna leaving the temple in a fit of self-righteous judgment. I'm not going to be part of that. They're so corrupt. God called me out. No, not Anna. She stayed and she never left. Never gave up pursuing her calling in the temple. So no matter what shape it's in, the temple, which is today the church, is still the temple of God. It's still made up of his people whom he loves. There are cases, yeah, in our time when people that administrate the temple of the Lord might be unrighteous or greedy or abusive, that's true. But it's still the Lord's temple and it's still the Lord's people. Anybody wants to hear clearly from God needs to get a firm grasp on that principle. Sometimes when I teach my prophetic school, I say, if you come into this fellowship, you tell me you're a prophet, and I say, what church do you come from? And you can't answer, you're not a prophet. Then you want to remember that the dominant form of religion in that day among the people of God was lifelessly legalistic, and a lot of people practiced it, not, not for the sake of the Lord, but to be noticed by others and praised by people for how holy they were. Well, Anna wasn't like that. Apparently she didn't separate herself because all that corruption or the self-righteous ones who can be so hurtful to you. She didn't walk away in judgment of them. Instead, she just faithfully participated in the temple services and the temple sacrifices and remained in the fellowship of all those who were true in their devotion to God as well as with those who weren't. Apparently, as I read the text, apparently she ministered consistently in ways that everybody had to recognize. She ministered to people consistently in ways that everybody had to recognize or they would not have called her a prophetess. 
So she had a right heart where God's people are concerned, and it, and it kept her in a position to recognize the fulfillment of all that she'd prayed for all of her life when it came. So she never left the temple, serving night and day with fastings and prayers. And the key word is serving. Serving. Loving God. Loving his people. Touching them with grace. Touching them with mercy. See, people who hear, cons- who hear accurately from God. I mean, is there anybody in this room who doesn't want to hear from God? No, God, I don't want you talking to me. <laughs> you might tell me something I don't want to hear. Don't want you talking to me. Okay? No, people who hear accurately from God are committed to God and to his people no matter what condition his people might be in And they're dedicated to prayer and fasting, first for intimacy with God, and second for the sake of God's people. Every truly prophetic person I know today is a person who's given to prayer, and it's mostly in hiddenness. I see a lot of, you know, people with raw prophetic gifts running around looking to be noticed, and they leave churches because they didn't pay attention to my word. Well, mostly in hiddenness. I mean, occasionally they're called to speak out But the ones that I know are reliable actually prefer the hidden place of prayer, no matter how visible they may be forced to become. Every church that I've ever seen or known of that has a powerful impact for revival on a culture or a nation has cultivated a strong grounding in prayer ministry, people gathering to seek God together. So Anna was a prophetess. She's serving humbly in the temple year after year, with fastings and prayers. And we have people in this church who carry all kinds of gifts and we value them all. We need them all. All of them are powered, but all of them, listen, all of them are powered by fastings, prayers, and deep worship, just like it was for Anna. Now the crises that, yeah, yeah, give it that. Thank you. The crises we face right now in this world, I'm gonna tell you, they're far from over. Turmoil and fear are going to go on for a long time. In these days to come, we're going to have to purposefully rekindle our passion for God and for his people. We're going to have to engage full force in fastings and prayers, whether or not you see yourself as prophetic, but especially if that's part of your gifting. Yeah, this is what will sustain us. This is what will sustain us. Just the same way that it did Anna all those long years. And it'll energize us as a whole people in the days to come. Laid back, listen, at the risk of offending somebody listening online, laid back, passive, watered down Christianity is done. It has run its course. And it won't work anymore. It doesn't have the power to carry us through everything that's coming on the world. Verse 38. At that very moment, now it means just as Simeon was delivering his prophecy concerning Jesus, at that very moment she, Anna, came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. So old Dr. Luke went out of his way to tell us this is important. You, gotta, you really got to latch on to this. He went out of his way to tell us how long Anna had been at, at, at her prayer ministry. He could have told us simply that a prophetess came up and confirmed what Simeon was saying. That this is the Christ child and everything that would come from that. And It, it, it could have it been any woman, but he gave her a name and he described her to us. And he gave us a picture of what kind of woman Anna was in the same way that he considered important to tell us what kind of man Simeon was. That both of them had waited and hoped all their long lives into old age to see what God had promised. And we can learn from that. So here's the deal. Anna had been married. In their culture, that would have happened at about the age of 14 or 15. 
The reason they did that is they didn't want to mess around with all those hormones and give kids a chance to get in trouble. So let's get them married. <laughs> About 14, maybe 15. And she'd been married just seven years when her husband died. That would make her perhaps, what, 22 years old when she faced the tragedy of the loss of her husband. Well, when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus into the temple as an infant, 40 days old, Anna was 84. That means that for at least 62 years, she never left the temple, serving night and day, fasting and praying. 62 years of praying, fasting, waiting, longing, interceding for the fulfillment of God's promise that Israel would be redeemed. So there was, no, there was none of this on again, off again about her. She, ne she never, and by the way, she never waited for the mood to strike her. Amen. You know, we have a phrase in Christianity. You know, I just don't feel led. You know what that is? That's a mask for I'm not gonna obey God. Usually. You're waiting for a mood. Well, obedience doesn't depend on moods, does it? Depends on the word of God, and that's what life is made of. Amen. 62 years. Apparently, she never took a break. Never took a break when she felt bad or got discouraged or depressed. She didn't have, I don't think she had a, I, I just can't imagine she had a positive mood for 62 years. <laughs> that's my wife. That's my wife. She says it's possible. She was born stoned and it's never stopped. <laughs> you know what turned, I gotta tell you this, you know what turned me off the most when I met her? It was this constant sicky sweet smile, you know? Anyway, because I was the serious hippie. And if you're going to be a real hippie, you have to be kind of melancholy, you know. Anyway. So she never left the temple. Never had one of those, I mean, I, I know that she was discouraged and depressed from time to time, but she never left the temple. 62 years praying. Man, I want to tell you. I mean, she waited that long for the promise. I'm a wuss by comparison. I start wondering if, if a prophetic word is real or accurate if I have to wait even as long as a year. <laughs> you know, some of you have received God promises over your lives like I have, but you've fallen into darkness and discouragement and hurt when you've had to wait for what you felt uh, uh, for, for, for too long. You had to wait too long. And maybe you stopped believing those promises because it seemed like it was taking too long, but you know what? You stopped believing, and that only made it worse. Some of us here aren't yet 25 years old. You've already given up. <laughs> That's here. Nope, nope. She said, nope, on the front row, nope. But I want to tell you, God gave you a goal, a hope, and a promise. You sensed it, you understood it, you felt it calling you forward. That hasn't changed, and giving up is not an option. Both Simeon and Anna had divine appointments in the temple that day, and, be, and they had it because of faithful, faithfulness over long decades of waiting. And because of that, they were in position to receive the fulfillment of their deepest hopes when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus into the temple that day. They had to be, you gotta be there when it happens, right? I remember during the Toronto revival, People were trying to find reasons to pick at it, you know, the Toronto blessing going on up there. I was listening to Joseph Garlington. He's a powerful apostolic man of God. And somebody trying to find something to pick at said, well, how come you got to go to Toronto to find it? You know what Joe's answer was? Because that's where it is. Yeah. <laughs> you got to be in position when it happens. And so they were in position when it happened. Well, along the way, while you're waiting, there are going to be tragedies. There are going to be setbacks. 
Anna lost her husband. And you got to know that was a much worse blow in that culture than it would be in ours. Women had no place in that culture. They had nowhere to turn. But Anna made a decision, obviously. She never left the temple, serving night and day, fastings and prayers. 84, 62 years, she fasted and prayed, never leaving the temple. And she saw, and because of that, because she was there when it happened, she saw the fulfillment of what she had longed and prayed for. You know, I'm personally, I'm not yet as old as the years that Anna waited and prayed. I mean, well, I'm 69, but I'm not as old as she was. I'm just now entering into what God, at 69, I'm just, I, I know pastors that have retired. Well, at 69, I'm just now entering in to, 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 what I, to what God appointed for me when I was conceived in my mother's womb 70 years ago. It's a formidable woman, Anna. I'm still young next to her. I wanted to give this, I mean, this just Lord popped, I know this is God because it just popped into my head. I'm 69 years old. I don't look it. I don't feel it. And what I want to tell you is if you want to enter into what God has for you, take care of your body. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I discipline my body to make it my slave, lest I be disqualified. <laughs> yeah, no more sugar. Except at Christmas. Well, I got to tell you, my, my health food son's children gave me bags of peanut butter ball cookie things. Chocolate covered, and you put it in your mouth, and it shocks you with its goodness. And you say, I must have another. And a few minutes later, you're sick. Anyway, but that's my point. For Anna to be alive, awake, and serving in the temple at 84, you understand what I'm saying? I'm watching too many of my contemporaries hospitalized, having heart attacks, and all kinds of other stuff. Why? Because you're paying your old age for what you did to yourself when you were young. It happens. So straighten up and take care of your body. Anyway, side message. Whew. So she persevered all those years. I had a long list of prophecies spoken over my life when I was young. And I've watched how so many of them didn't seem ever to come to pass. I'm not tooting my own horn when I say I made, a ch I made a choice to persevere no matter how many years have passed. And a lot of you sitting in this place have made the same decision, and I promise you it will bear fruit. One of the consistent messages of Scripture is to persevere and endure. There's a lot of talk now about, oh, God's going to rapture us out of here before it gets any worse. Oh, knock it off. Knock it off. The most dominant message of Scripture in relation to what's coming is endure, persevere. James 1, verse 12, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Or Matthew 24, 12 and 13, because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. See, we're a generation who need to learn what it means to wait on the fullness of time. Our inability to wait has cost us a lot of heartache. God has a place and a time that's right and good if we wait for it. See, Anna isn't the only example of this in the Bible. Abraham was well past, 90, well past his 90th year when the son of promise was born. He had to wait that long. One of my favorite passages of scripture is Sarah, after the, after the messenger of the Lord talks to her and says she's gonna have a baby, she says, how can he give me pleasure? You want a, you want a, a, a paraphrase of that? <laughs> he can't get it up anymore, how's that gonna work? 
That's the point. I'm serious. Scripture doesn't hold these things back. How many times did Abraham question whether he'd actually heard God at all? And we know he despaired because the stories are there. He went into Hagar and had Ishmael. God said, that's not the one. So he despaired, but he always came back. Jeremiah, the prophet, prophesied something like 25 years concerning the judgment of God and the destruction of Jerusalem before it happened. And people began to mock him. Where's the fulfillment of the word? And he complained to the Lord about that and actually begged God to let him off the hook. And God told him no. And so he kept on, and in the fullness of time, his word came to pass. See, in this age of instant pain relievers and instant breakfast and microwave popcorn, which is no good without a ton of butter, you know, <laughs> yeah, amen. Microwave popcorn ready in three minutes, drive through restaurants and all the rest of it. We need to get a grip on the meaning of time. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, Right? Well, waiting is a character builder. And most character builders really suck. <laughs> you know, praying consistently over a long period of time for something that you know God has spoken builds a kind of strength and holiness into you that you can't, that it can't come to you any other way. Few things will refine you in holiness like Waiting. Is first you get impatient. Well, one of the fruits of the Spirit is patience. I hate that word. So God, who wants you and me to look like him, chooses to school us in patience. And patience can only come through waiting. I had to wait for my wife to grow up after we got married. She was barely 19. I wasn't yet 20. Or 21. Yeah, I was, yeah, I Give me a break, that's 48 years ago, okay? So, yeah, I wasn't yet 21. She was barely 19. I had to wait for her to grow up, and she had to wait for the changes in me and for me to become the man the Lord showed her when, 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 when she met me because I wasn't that man. There was this man, and then there was the one God showed her. And she had to wait for that. And there were times that I'm sure that we, we, we thought, if we made a mistake... I've had to wait for this church to wade through all the years of trial and turmoil to begin to become the ministry I envisioned 28 years ago. There were times I wanted to give up and quit. Times I despaired. There were times when the pain was so overwhelming I didn't think I could absorb any more of it. And I used to complain, <laughs> but God wouldn't let me quit. There were promises spoken over us as a people prophecies of what God would do that were given from day one by top people. And we waited and we prayed and we didn't stop and now it begins to unfold in the fullness of time. I used to complain to the Lord, God, the clock is ticking, you're running out of time, I'm getting older. <laughs> and you need to pray a prayer like that, God just looks at you and folds his arms and says, are you done? So I wonder if Anna and Simeon ever felt that way. Simeon, nearing the end of his life, he's ready to die. Anna's in her 84th year. I'm a, kind of a kid by comparison. Most of my life, most of my life, I've had to wait too long. If I've, if I've had to wait too long, I get angry or I get discouraged or I do the right thing at the wrong time. You all know what I'm talking about with that one? And that sets me up for more hurt, more fear, and more turmoil. And once you know it, one of the fruits of the Spirit is peace. So the first thing that comes with any promise of God is a period of character adjustment. I'm pretty sure there are people sitting here in this, in this flock who are tired of being single, and you long for a mate. It's like, oh God, when are you going to show me the one? And maybe you get mad at him. And you get discouraged and your faith is shaken because you don't like the weight. And actually, the lo no, I'm not going to say that one. <laughs> Maybe I will. I was going to say, the longer you wait, 
the more that people who are single in their old age are single because there's a reason for it. Never mind. <laughs> okay, I lift that off certain people in this room. I just... But the point is, God makes you wait while he molds you and he shapes you so that your character can receive the blessing. You know, Anna was a woman of character. She was given to God. She was humble. She knew how to wait. She knew how to persevere and not give up. She knew how to stay at it until the promise comes. She knew how to pray until. We need to learn to pray until. Lord, I'm tired of talking about this. Pray until. She and Simeon had been given a goal from God. They'd been given a purpose of something to come that would change everything. It was something she wanted with all her heart to see and God wanted to bring to pass that a savior would come for the people of God. How many of us have prayed for how many long years for the great last days outpouring of God's spirit that we see promised in his word? How long, some of us? So Anna began to pray. And by the way, there are people right now who will mock me online. Oh, you've been saying this about the great coming of that great outpouring forever. Where is it? You know, how many of us have prayed that way? So Anna began to pray. And here's a little bit of perspective. We've been a church less than half as long as Anna waited and prayed and fasted for the coming of the Messiah, that visitation of God before she saw Joseph, Mary, and the baby come into the temple. The oldest of my grown children has only been alive about two-thirds of the time that Anna devoted to prayer after her 22nd birthday. Doesn't it seem like the bigger the promise, the longer the wait? You know, God serves no wine before it's time. We begin, we begin to pray God begins to set things in motion. Most of the time, he doesn't bother to tell us about that. He doesn't, I mean, he doesn't bother to tell us what's been set in motion, right? And then one thing that we don't see affects another thing that we don't see that triggers the next thing that we don't see until it all adds up to the purpose of God in the fullness of time. But, oh, God's not doing nothing. I don't think there's ever a time that God isn't doing something. And all we have to do is be faithful enough to be in position at the right time in the right place because of faithfulness and perseverance to receive it, just like Simeon and Anna. I began praying 20, more than 20 years ago. 28 years ago, we founded this church. I've been 44 years in full-time ministry. I began praying 28 years ago for a selfless church that would touch the community with love and with service and not be focused on itself. A church that would value giving above personal healing. I wanted to see the hungry fed. I wanted to see the naked clothed. I wanted to see people that nobody else wanted to come into the body of Christ and get redeemed, transformed, healed, and launched into lives that would be a testimony to the power of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. I wanted to see people sharing their faith in the community. Loving one another and those outside, not performing it, but driven by a heart of love that would come directly from Jesus in the heart of the Father. There have been times we would have two or three witches sitting on the back row. People come and say, what are you going to, what are you going to do? There's some witches in here. Do you know that? And I said, fine, that's great. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because, yeah, we're going to burn them down in the Holy Spirit, man. We're going to, you know. <laughs> And now I begin to see it unfolding with every passing day. What if I'd given up? Could have. I didn't have to be in Denver. Could have made other choices. So I long for a fresh outpouring of God's spirit. I, I long for a foundation in love and a focus beyond ourselves. I see that foundation is, I believe that foundation's been laid. It's nearly time for a biblical level of God's power and love to be poured out in miracles and healings and winning the lost and seeing their lives changed and filled. Cancer should be healed on a more consistent basis here. People should be getting up out of wheelchairs. 
tell you what I'd like to believe, you know, if this building, we didn't build this building. This building was built by Baptists a long time ago. And it wasn't built with ADA specs, you know, so people could, you know, get in with wheelchairs and stuff. We put the chairs out there, you know, the, the ones that, they're actually kind of fun to ride, you know. <laughs> we, we put those in, but wouldn't it be a joke that the Lord said, no, I'm not going to give you an ADA accessible building because they're going to get healed before they can get in the door. Wouldn't that be great? I mean, we see healings on a regular basis here. We do. But God's word shows me more and bigger. I believe God has promised me and you, John 14, 12, it's the most tormenting passage in scripture for me. <laughs> truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And see, the qualification isn't that you're an apostle, or you're a prophet or something like that. And there's no time limit on this. He who believes in me will do the works that I do and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Well, how are you going to do greater works than Jesus? I think we've got to fall on our faces and pray until this happens. It's his word. I could ask, when does this happen? I could say, Lord, we've asked before. How many times do we have to ask? How long do we have to pray? I'm tired of praying for this. I'm moving on to other things. And I've seen people move on to other things. You know what? They weren't happy when they did. Anna could have remarried. She could have centered her life on raising children, raising more children and serving a husband. She could have centered her life on keeping a home, but she never left the temple. Day and night, fastings and prayers. She prayed until 62 years. I'm afraid to ask how many here are older than 62. <laughs> it's a few. We got a handful. Older than 62. How many are younger than 62? Yeah, there you go. All right. You know what my point is? Most of us in this room have a long way to go. <laughs> it's too early to back off. It's too early to give up. God announced the coming of Jesus hundreds of years before Jesus came. And he set in motion all the currents and, and, and sequences of events that would set the stage at just the right time and the right place with just the right people to bring about the fulfillment. So he stationed Anna in the temple for 62 years as a watchwoman. Pray, fast, intercede until the fullness of time would come with the answer to her prayers and the fruit of her labors. I've seen enough of the hand of God changing people in this place and establishing love in this place and driving out uncleanness and judgment and anger and hate and offense, giving us a heart that I can believe that he'll fulfill what he called us to do from the start. You as individuals, each one of us, you're going to come into your destinies. You're going to come into your fulfillment. God's going to pour out his favor on you. And it's not going to pour out his favor on you, not as consumers for the sake of self. That's not it. That's what we've got to break. But for the sake of the advancement of God's kingdom. So the blessing on you would be assigned to the, the blessing on you would be assigned to the world of the reality of the Savior that you serve. Yeah. You know what? I, back in 2007, the Lord told me about the financial crisis that was coming, and he said, I want you to tell your people that if they'll remember just to walk with the Lord, that I'll preserve them, every family. And during that period of time, I don't know of anybody in our flock that lost a job, not one, during that economic downturn. And here we sit now, Sitting under the Lord's favor, we've come through another economic crisis, probably worse than the one in 2008. And I don't know anybody in our flock that's lost a job. I don't know of anybody that had to close, maybe one. She got a promotion? Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? I don't know of a business 
in this flock that's had to close. God's taking care of us. We haven't even had, we haven't even had a case of COVID. And we never closed our church. And so I'm just saying that the favor of God comes and people have to look at it. And they have to glorify Jesus because of it, because of the favor on you. I believe that God's going to fulfill the many prophecies over me and those who have been called to walk with me. This church is going to impact a city and a nation and a world in greater ways than we ever have. He's going to multiply our numbers without loss of love or intimacy. His presence is going to be manifest here in ways that even the world outside cannot deny. And I know it's coming because I've watched the foundation take shape. Because I see an old woman named Anna praying in the temple for 62 years until the promise of God would come to pass. And his visitation could be seen in a small baby who would grow up to save the world. Anna had to rise. This is important too. Anna had to rise above a personal tragedy in the death of her husband in order to do this. Some of us will have to rise above personal hard times and obstacles to do this. But we can do it. You know why we can do it? Because we've been given something that Anna and Simeon did not have. We live after the Holy Spirit was poured out in the baptism of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. We live after the Spirit of Jesus came to dwell in our hearts and lives. One of the differences between the old dispensation and the new is it says the, Holy, the, the Spirit of God was on Simeon. And what you see with us is the Holy Spirit is in us. And that's a big difference. Amen. We have a power that they hadn't yet received. I don't have to read it in the pages of Scripture to know that Anna went through times of discouragement as the years went by. And Israel only seemed to get worse. Some of us here have waited long and the times of discouragement have stretched out. Now our nation and everything that we ever thought we could rely upon are disintegrating around us, shaken by the worst crisis on more fronts than probably since the Civil War. We're going to have to rise above it and move on as Anna did. Eyes fixed on the hope of our salvation. Eyes fixed on the promises of God. Until the promise comes, we pray, we persevere, we stand the ground. And we'll be a prophetic, we'll be a prophetic house together. It's coming. I want you to keep that in mind in the coming years. It doesn't make any, I want to tell you, it doesn't make any big difference right now how the election fight comes out. It isn't, it isn't going to make a lot of difference, at least not initially, if Trump gets in and wins all the court battles and all the stuff that's going, or if Biden comes in. The years ahead are going to be tumultuous in a number of ways. And so stop, be still, touch God, touch others. Don't be imprisoned by personal tragedies. Don't be imprisoned by, by disappointed dreams and the loneliness of seasons past. We are not prisoners. We are members of a prophetic people who are called to prayer and fasting until the promise of God should come. Let a nation of Annas arise. Let this people discover all over again the joy of praying and seeing the glory of God come. 2021 is obviously a pivotal year for good or for ill. Be ready for it. What I want to do today as we close for those who want to linger a bit is I, I want to bless intercessors. People that want to follow in the steps of Anna and devote major portions of your life to praying as Anna did. So, here's what we're going to do. If you need, you know, we don't have official amen in this church. If you need to go, you can. But I'm going to need first some ministry team up here. I want to do one more song and then I'm going to come down and lay hands on people. Um, but if you, are you hearing what I'm saying? If you want to ignite this in your life, this is that time. This is that time to rise to the challenge.
This is that time to get yourself in a position where, where you're in place to receive when the promise comes. Amen. Oh, my Lord, breathe on me. Touch my eyes and make me see. Wake me, Lord, from my sleep to hear you.